Domini Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Veni, Sancte Spiritus, Graphile Tuorum, Corda Fidelium, et Tui Amoris in Eis, in Imacende, Emite Spiritum Tuum, et Caria Luntur. Et Venem Avis Pacientere. Remus Deus, Corda Fidelium, Sancti Spiritus, Illustratione Dottoristi, Dana Lucia Negadem, Spiritu Recta Sapere, et de Eus, in Pater Consolatione Gaudere, per Christum et Dominium Nostrum. Amen. Sere se sapientiae. Ora pro nobis. In nome Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Well, today I'm going to back up a little. We, we touched on the Spanish Inquisition some time ago. Uh, but Daras didn't go into as much detail as I was hoping. So I essentially just said that you know, don't blame Torquemada for anything that went wrong. <laughs> uh, I want to go into a little more detail on what exactly the Inquisition did. And, I might, and even after this, I may, may go into still more detail, find still more information on it. But anyway, I took some information from the author Guggenberger, whom I mentioned last time, but I think I referred to him as being a cardinal. There's a, a different, there's a Another church historian who was a cardinal, but not Guggenberg, who's not one of them. But we have, the, we have his works in the library. So I'm just going to talk about, okay, the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, first, the origins of the Inquisition were the investigation and punishment of heresy, apostasy, sacrilege, and other crimes uh, committed against religion. Uh, of course, such investigations and punishments date back to the institution of the church and the earliest centuries of the church. So that's in itself, it's not a new thing that heresy, apostasy, etc., would be investigated and punished. That's, that's not something that was unique to the uh, late 15th, early 16th centuries uh, that are for, any, for any of the period of time for which the Inquisition was operating. That, that, those were the area, the, that was the time when she was getting started, but really Think about the, the principle on which it's operating. It's not a new thing. Uh, because after all, Christ did commission his church to preach and preserve the, his religion unchanged until the end of time. Uh, for which purpose? Uh, those of you who were here for De Ecclesia, it was years ago we had that class, but uh, those of you who are here for it will remember that uh, the church does have, uh, the apostles do have the power, of course, of of teaching and ruling, which means making laws and judging and punishing people who transgress those laws. Uh, of course, the church has always recognized the distinction between the baptized and the unbaptized. Um, sounds very obvious, but the, the point of it is that, uh, that those who are baptized, even if they apostatize from the faith, do not cease to be subject to the laws of the church as a result. They can be lawfully, lawfully coerced and punished for precisely for the crimes of apostasy or, or whatever else, of heresy, schism. Uh, of course, those who are, were never baptized are not subject to the church, uh, cannot be forced to accept the faith or punished for not accepting it. In the case of, of Christians, of Catholics who are guilty of heresy, the church is bound, of course, to admonish them. So it's normal, uh, normal, procedure really for anything somebody has done something objectively criminal I'm going to warn him uh, unless it's unless it's always always already so obvious but as a general you're going to warn someone before you, you punish him so first the church would always admonish and warn Catholics who are guilty of heresy uh, warn them in charity and patience uh, to and sometimes it's necessary to impose penalties which are calculated to change their minds bring them back to their senses and only then, if, if all else fails, to excommunicate them. Um, the civil power in a, in a thoroughly Catholic state has the uh, right of punishing heresy uh, based on both the natural and the revealed law. Uh, we say the natural because that's just part of, as we said earlier, heresy is very subversive to this, even just to the civil order, not only to the ecclesiastical order, not only to ecclesiastical authority and to the good of souls, but even just to the order of the state. Heresy is, is, is very subversive, very disruptive, causes a great deal of chaos and turmoil, even wars, even wars of religion. Uh, so in a thoroughly Catholic state, clearly the civil rulers are going to want to punish that. They're going to understand that, and they're going to take measures to ensure that the heresy 
or apostasy, whatever it is, whatever crime against the faith, does not spread if for no other consideration than because of the repercussions that will inevitably ensue in the civil order. Uh, and then a uh, scriptural quotation for this is that the prince is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath upon him that doth evil. And of course, St. Paul teaches how, just how great a crime heresy is. And in fact, in fact it's, from, it's from the apostle that we uh, get a description of, of essentially going through the procedure of uh, issue, a war on someone who has uh, essentially said something heretical. Uh, if, he doesn't, if he doesn't retract, then warn him again. After that, avoid him. So essentially, essentially laying out for the church the procedures which, which he has always followed. Uh, and the church has always, yes. Father, what did you quote specifically? That was uh, Romans. Romans chapter 13. Uh, then, of course, the church has always declared it lawful for the state to punish heretics. But, and of course, it has never said that the church absolutely must put every heretic to death, obviously. It has never, uh, has had never said that the state is obliged to be as harsh as possible in meeting out punishment to heretics. But we give it again, given, given the, the correct circumstances, uh, the, the state is of course justified in putting heretics to death. Uh, the, let's see, the, this right of the state to do that, of punishing or otherwise repressing heresy, becomes a duty when severe measures are indispensable for the protection of the faithful or the preservation of human society. So the church, of course, has can call upon the secular arm for protection in these things. So when you have heretics who are rising up in armed rebellion, which was far from being unheard of, the church could very well call upon the secular arm to even use the military. And of course, there have been crusades, the Albigensians against the Albigensians in, in France, for example. Uh, crusades against heretics, literally raising the you know, civil rulers, raising armies to go and put down uh, armed insurrections of heretics. And so accordingly, so from the time uh, when the state <laughs> became Catholic under, under Emperor Constantine, Roman law decreed many several penalties, including confiscation of property, exile, imprisonment, uh, bodily, bodily punishment, corporal punishment, uh, other things such as incapability of inheriting or uh, of inheriting wills, uh, loss of civil rights, public infamy uh, against heretics, both men and women, as well as uh, other violators of the Catholic faith. Uh, so again, not, not only heresy. It considered heresy as an offense not only against the faith, but also against the state. As we've, as we've said, it is a crime against the state, but to the extent of being equivalent to high treason. So the highest crime you could commit against the state, it considered it equal to that that it, uh, it considered it a felonious attack upon the highest good of civil society, which is the unity of faith, and therefore punishable by the civil authority on its own account. Uh, because uh, according to the principle that what is done against the divine religion is an injury done to all, and that it is far more grievous to offend the divine than any human majesty. Uh, so various, various German nations, after their conversion, took the same view of, of heresy. Uh, even uh, even Frederick II, uh, who introduced uh, introduced uh, burning as the punishment of heresy in the in the in the empire, uh, the laws of English kings and parliaments increased the severity of punishment to be inflicted on obstinate heretics. Of course, <laughs> many stories of the, the brutal punishments inflicted on Catholics who were being treated as heretics during the reign of Queen Elizabeth, right, to name one instance. Of course, there were many many examples of that. Um, and then the reason was greater with, as we mentioned, the Albigensians, uh, Hussites, and there were other, other sects like the Lollards. Uh, they were an earlier sect. But, they, but of course, these, these sects, they also threatened the stability of marriage. That's another way, not only just through direct armed insurrection, but also you know, threatening the stability of marriage, declaring marriage to be an evil thing and encouraging uh, either, either by their own actions or by even in theory, all kinds of other impurities and all kinds of other you know, perversion as a substitute for marriage, essentially. 
Uh, so I mean, obviously when you, when you attack marriage, you're attacking the family, which is the basic building block of society. And that's an important thing to remember because the idea that the individual is the basic building block of society, if you, if you want to look at it by analogy to a, a, you know, a structure, an architectural structure, yeah, the family is the basic element, not the individual. It's a liberal idea that the individual is the, sort of, is the basic element, uh, that there's essentially nothing in between the state and the individual. That's a liberal idea. Uh, we, could, we could spend a long time talking about that, but suffice it to say that that is the case and that it's always true, I and mean, even those who deny it, it is true that family, that society, societies, larger societies are essentially made up of families. And so and obviously you have a heresy that is attacking marriage, it's attacking the family, it's attacking the state at its very foundation, in fact. So it's cer certainly justified for civil powers to take whatever means, of course, are necessary and proportionate, all those things being kept in mind, everything has to be in proportion. Uh, <coughs> so the uh, civil powers that take the means that are proportionate to putting down the, the, the spread of any kind of heresy, and it's especially urgent when it's attacking things like, like that, urgent to, especially urgent to the state. It's always a danger to souls, of course. Uh, and uh, other things that these heresies will attack are, uh, of course, uh, uh, the court, we've mentioned stability of marriage, but also private ownership, uh, the very foundations of all civil order, uh, the, the faith itself in church and state, and then uh, also by means of widespread conspiracies and pow powerful military organizations. So you see, we're talking about fighting crusades against the Albigensians. They had, clearly they had the capability of waging war to enforce their beliefs in their areas or which they controlled. And so, uh, there were, it turns out that bishops, legates, 52 synods, and three general councils, among those synods, testified to the imminence of, of the dangers of these things. So it's been affirmed many, many times by the church that these things are, are, are useful and even, even in, on occasion necessary. Uh, okay, so the, uh, but the ecclesiastical tribunal of the Inquisition was uh, something that had, you say the, the realization for its necessity developed gradually. Uh, the first decree uh, was is the ordering bishops to inquire into the presence of heretics in their dioceses was uh, issued by Pope Lucius III in 1183. It's called the Episcopal Inquisition. Uh, so we're, we're taking, we're stepping back a few centuries here. Uh, by the time of the Fourth Lateran Council, 1215, and the Synod of Toulouse, in 1229, the principal rules of the, of the institution were established. Uh, on account of the negligence and corruption of some inquisitors, Pope Gregory IX in 1232 uh, appointed the Dominicans as inquisitors. That was the papal inquisition. So we've moved, uh, we've moved from Episcopal to now papal inquisition. Uh, without, of course, he so he appointed Dominicans to this, but didn't exclude other orders or abolish the Episcopal inquisition, just added to it. Uh, procedure began, so he did have a certain procedure, began with a citation. If the suspected party obeyed the summons within a specified time, all risk of severe punishment was precluded. So uh, if you come, come before us before this date, if, if you do, then you know, things will very likely be easy for you. Yes? Right, uh, what was the name of uh, the Pope who um, commissioned the Dominicans to be included? That was Pope Gregory IX in 1232. Uh, so, uh, but if, if, but if, the, if the person in question uh, refused to obey the summons, he would be arrested only at that point. Uh, the, uh, the juridical view pre prevalent, as, yeah, as the, so the, the, the prevalent juridical view put uh, heresy on the same level as treason, high treason, the maxims of the Roman law concerning uh, crimen lese maestatis, which means high treason, were applied to the case. Uh, it was for this reason uh, that everybody was bound uh, to uh, see to a problem here. Uh, the names of the witnesses, for one thing, were not uh, made were not made known to the accused, uh, who had the right of naming his personal enemies and excluding them from being witnesses. 
and uh, there was a, at the same time a commission of men who had to decide upon the fitness of the witnesses. So there was a, a witness vetting process that went on here. Uh, the accused could be, uh, it says, I have to, to look into this a little more to find out what exactly it is, but it says could be subjected to the rack to look into that. That sounds like a torture, so I'd have to look into that. Uh, they said, though, under important restrictions and in a milder form than used by secular courts, that's on my list of things to look at. Uh, see what exactly that meant. Uh, if the, actually, so if the first hearing, so they, they did have hearings in these tribunals, if the first hearing showed the innocence of the accused, he was set free. Uh, if the case remained doubtful, he was either released on the condition of reappearing, uh, reappearing on another day or detained for further investigation. Uh, the final sentence was passed by the inquisitor in union with the respected bishop, assisted by a council of theologians, jurists, and other prominent men. So you really had clearly very qualified people uh, sitting in on these things. <laughs> a rigorous process. It wasn't just pull, pull somebody in and burn them at the stake right away. Uh, see, the acts of the trial were laid before the bishop, the local bishop, in full, uh, before the, and before his, the council, the Inquisition, in, in its substance. Uh, the solemn promulgation of the sentence, which was called a sermo, uh, took place in the cathedral or principal church with appropriate ceremonies in the presence of the people. Uh, it had three parts. First was the promulgation of graces, as it was called, which commuted the penalties of those who had been sentenced in a previous such ceremony uh, to lighter sentences or canceled them entirely. The second step was the promulgation of the current uh, excommunications, or sentences, sorry, uh, four kinds of punishments could be imposed. There were ones that were called minatory, usually some kind of conditional excommunication. Uh, another, others were minor penances, minores, such as good works, alms, fasts, or pilgrimages. Others were called defamatory, which, considered, which included the wearing of public habiliments, so some kind of garment that marked someone as, for, as having committed a crime of a certain nature. So yellow crosses, for example, were used to mark heretics. Uh, let's see. I have to look this up. Yellow discs. So it had different things for, so if somebody was into sorcery, there would be a different mark. Uh, there, if there were, uh, they, would, they would even use, says, four, this author says, four red tongues to uh, mark a false witness. So I guess if you lied, if you, turned, if you were called to be a witness and then you lied, you would be marked with four red tongues to show everybody that you misuse your tongue. Uh, and then my, major punishments included the confiscation of property, perpetual imprisonment, or death. So you had to, be, had to have done something pretty serious and then been obstinate in order to get one of those severe punishments which apparently were very rarely inflicted, and when inflicted were changed uh, very frequently into lighter ones at a subsequent ceremony, one of these, another ceremony. Uh, pecuniary fines to be inflicted uh, on, the, on the, so the, some of the, the lower classes, uh, the ones who were uh, uh, convicted of less serious crimes, were prohibited from the mid-13th century, so from 1244. Uh, the inquisitors, uh, it said, he says, waged many fearless combats against royal officials to save the properties of those who did not fall into this class of the ones who had committed the most serious crimes. And part of the ceremony was devoted to sentencing absent or fugitive members, because that did happen. People would not answer the summons or they would run away. They'd have to, they did sentence those people to become, I suppose you'd say, ecclesiastical outlaws or something like that. Uh, but again, if... Uh, yeah, we'll move on here. So the, uh, of course, we you you may be able to pick out in one case or another that there was some there was some excess perhaps, but and that's not to be confused with the, the principles being applied here. The principles behind all of this uh, we've seen uh, are sound, and even the application uh, to people who were uh, who uh, who were compliant. There wasn't, a, there wasn't too much trouble. If, if, if you were accused of some crime, uh, some, some kind of heresy, or for having, as we'll see, you know, only a feign of conversion and you know, essentially owned up to the crime and, uh, and, and retracted it if it was heresy, or if, it was a, or if you had feigned a conversion and to actually live as a Catholic, as a true Catholic after that, then it wouldn't be so bad. 
but only if you were some, done something very bad and, and refused to repent of it would you get the death sentence. And it seems many times that was uh, even that, that was uh, commuted to something else. Uh, but now, so that, that's, that's these earlier inquisitions we've been talking about. Uh, the Spanish Inquisition owed its uh, origin to the intrigues of the groups of people in Spain who were called the Moranos and Moriscos, who were Jews and Muslims, who feigned conversion and got themselves baptized in order to pursue with greater safety their sinister purpose of undermining the Catholicity and the nationality of the Spanish people. So they were un working to undermine the state and as a way of doing that, or even outside of undermining the state, just wanting to advance themselves more easily without being marked as being a, a Jew or a Muslim in a, in a Catholic nation. Uh, they, would, they would feign conversion, maybe receive, go through the at least the ceremonies of receiving baptism and get into society and we'll see into, even into high ranking positions uh, as, a, as a result of doing that. Uh, of course, this is always a problem. You know, if you have if you have a lot of people doing this, you're going to have to deal with it. And because they're baptized, remember they're subject to the laws of the church. If they just remained Jews or Muslims as such, then uh, openly as such, they would never be called before an inquisition. So basically, you want to join the church? Okay, you're going to have to be actually be a Catholic. That's that was the idea. And so when you have a, a problem, a lot of people doing this, you're going to need some kind of means of repression, uh, some way to put down the number of people doing this. And sometimes, if it's a if it's a widespread problem like it was, those means have to be have to be have to have a certain amount of energy. Uh, have to have to be vigilant. There has to be a, a, an extraordinary degree of vigilance in order to sort out you know, the, the wheat from the chaff. So, when Ferdinand and Isabella, of course, ascended the the throne, uh, they they took uh, control over Spain. Uh, there were uh, so the author says that northern Africa was uh, teeming with Mohammedans. There were, there were many, of course, uh, parts, the most southern part of Spain being very close to Africa, there were many Muslims uh, very close by. The Mediterranean was becoming a Turkish sea, and Granada, also in southern Spain, was still the dependent center of millions of Muslims uh, scattered throughout the mountains of Granada and uh, other areas, other, other port cities, or other cities which were port cities. And which were, of course, they would have been open to receiving a Turkish fleet. So they've got not only a problem with Muslims, but people, Muslims pretending to convert, essentially, as well, of course, or, and Jews also. Uh, in the rest of Spain, uh, the, uh, see them, the, the Maranos, the, the, the Jews who had feigned conversion, uh, had acquired an ever growing influence. Uh, and uh, various kings had. Uh, had, had continued to give them privileges uh, because uh, uh, they, were actually, they, were, they were given high offices. Uh, even, they were even on the king's council. They, they, they uh, obtained high ecclesiastical positions. Even some of them became bishops. So you might have the case of a, a shocking case of a, a bishop who was secretly practicing Judaism. <laughs> that was entirely possible. In fact, there was, uh, last year we had in the reading about the Latin life of St. Teresa, there was some case of somebody who was considered, some was a nun, I think, was considered to be a mystic, very holy, even a saint, but it turned out she was involved in all kinds of horrible things and brought other, you know, pulled other people into it. So it, it, was, a, it was a serious problem. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't, we weren't isolated incidents. Uh, of course, a lot of the, 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 some of these people were very wealthy, and so, be, being wealthy and then pretending and then converting, you know, becoming baptized, they were then able to intermarry with the, some of the, the nobler families of the land. So they were able to rise up through the hierarchy that way, the social hierarchy in that way. Uh, but of course, this whole time, some of them at least, uh, enough of them for it to be problematic, were using the advantages of their positions uh, for the purpose of building up Judaism, for one thing, the Jews who, who pretended to convert, uh, on the ruins of Spanish Catholicity and the and Spanish nation. Uh, and apparently they even approached Queen Isabella with the offer of instructing her in their creed. <laughs> I imagine she turned it down. 
the, let's see, and so this author very dramatically says that the question for Catholic Spain was to be or not to be, and that the danger grew apace when the number of Moriscos, the national allies of the Maranos, swelled to large proportions in consequence of the conquest of Granada. So uh, Ferdinand and Isabella conquered Granada, apparently they, they left the city and then they, they spread out. So under these circumstances, the Catholic sovereigns asked for and obtained from Pope Sixtus IV, whom we've seen before, permission to establish a tribunal for searching out and punishing these heretics. And they, 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 they labeled these people just as being heretics. Uh, uh, even I might secretly practice in Judaism. Uh, they, was, they were put under the, the title of heretic, at least as far as uh, the, the offense that they were perpetrating against the state. Uh, the po uh, so they, they asked for this help in the year 1478. Uh, the Pope granted it to them. He granted that they could have this inquisition, but with certain conditions. One of them was that the judges should be at least 40 years of age, uh, irreproachable character, masters or bachelors of theology, and a doctors or, licen or licentiates of canon law. So they had to have a certain amount of experience and a good deal of education to even stand a chance of being on this inquisition. So again, it wasn't just a matter of ignorant people trying uh, uh, heretics and burning them at the stake. These were very uh, highly educated people who were on these on these uh, on these courts and these tribunals. Yes. So they had to be 40, 40 years of age. They had to yes. Be, uh, doctor in canon law. That yes, that was one of the yes. Okay. Uh, basically, they had to they, they had, to, had to be highly educated. They had to know what they were dealing with. Not like today, we have, in, at least in the U.S., juries of people just pulled off the street. <laughs> this, was not the, this was not a case of that. These, again, they had to be uh, at least a master's or a bachelor's in theology. So they had to have degrees in theology, uh, doctors or, licen or licentiates in canon law. So they had to be highly educated. And again, 40, at least 40 years old, they had to have this, a degree of experience in these things. Uh, so again, it was, it was then in 1483 that Sixtus IV conferred on the Dominican Thomas de Torca, uh, Thomas Torquemada the office of Grand Inquisitor or president of the highest tri tribunal with the right of receiving appeals from all of the lower tribunals and of delegating his power to others. So essentially he was the one in charge of the main tribunal but that could be delegated to uh, lower courts that could hear cases in other areas. Uh, so the Grand Inquisitor was to be nominated by the king but received his canonical confirmation from the Holy See. So the, Spa the Spanish Inquisition was, then, was therefore something of a, a mixed tribunal. There were many people, many ecclesiastics involved, but at the same time, it was essentially a civil institution that was dealing with uh, problems that uh, were threatening the civil order. Of course, not to say that this wasn't a problem for the church also, but they were the ones who uh, instigated it, ones who uh, asked the Pope for permission to get this started and who set it up, essentially, even if you know, the people involved were, it was done with the Pope's agreement and that there were ecclesiastics with certain, with certain uh, qualifications, it was still essentially a civil tribunal. Uh, so the, the Pope never gave up, the Popes never gave up their right of receiving appeals, which is interesting to note. Uh, the Grand Inquisitor was assisted by a council of five, uh, and without consulting him, no provincial inquisitor could imprison a priest, a knight, or a nobleman. And every baptized individual belonging to the Spanish hierarchy, uh, bishops, uh, including the king himself, and the royal court were subject to the Inquisition. So if it turned out that the, the king was involved in you know, uh, occult Judaism, he could be called before the tribunal and potentially sentenced. You know, on the principle that those who are baptized are subject to the jurisdiction of the church and that these were ecclesiastics who were running it. Uh, so the, the procedure was essentially the same as, as, you, as in ecclesiastical courts of inquisition, which you would expect since it's being run by ecclesiastics. Uh, the tribunal invariably began its sessions by proclaiming a season of grace, as it, was, as it was called, of 40 to 60 or even 120 days. So you had at least a month, sometimes a few months, uh, to show up if you were summoned to one of these things. Uh, and all those who came forward during such periods, so this was not only a period just to show up, but if you came forward in that period, and uh, if you were you know, guilty of heresy, 
uh, confess the heresy, even if it have, even if it were a relapse, uh, and everyone who did that would be reconciled without occurring any severe penance. So you see, it's uh, they're not they're, they weren't out just to kill people, <laughs> clearly. Yes. How would they go about summoning the person? Well, you find out where the person lives and send out a messenger with the document saying show up, or else. You know, the, the equivalent of you know, 15th century equivalent of emails. Let's do that story. Nothing, nothing ever really changes. There's a story once of St. Francis de Sales, who just as he, right as he was about to give a sermon once, someone gave him a note. It was currently at the time there was a practice of sending out these notes, these small notes. It was a bit like, just like receiving a text message or something. But somebody gave it to him right as he was getting into the pulpit. As some, some, he had been accused of something or some enemy was attacking him. I don't remember what exactly it was, but something that would give, give you a tremendous amount of distraction. He's about to give a sermon, but... But he, he just pushed it aside, got up and gave the sermon, and then dealt with the problem later. But again, it just goes to nothing ever really changes. That was the equivalent of a text message at that time. Just, it just becomes faster and more efficient, but it's always the same. Uh, I was just looking at which reminds me we were talking about humanism before. Uh, there was a, a resurgence of paganism and uh, worship of nature. And it's, it's true, you look at uh, you can call it the religion of green, so some people call it uh, climate change. <laughs> About how it has all the every all the characteristics of a religion. It's incredible, but it's not really. I mean, it's really not incredible when you know that we know where it's coming from. But it's it's interesting to look at that, just to what extent the parallels go. But yeah, that's another story. Uh, that, that would be an interesting class to give, would be about, about modern paganism. Yes? Sorry, Father, could we hear the name of the Grand Inquisitor again? Thomas Torquemada, a very f a famous character. Torquemada. And, okay, so, let's see. Again, and then stress it again that the court never proceeded against unconverted Jews or Muslims, or Moors, as they were called in Spain. They were never never proceeded against them because they were not baptized. Uh, no arrests could be made before the guilt was proved, so there had to be some evidence at least, and every arrest required a unanimous vote. Uh, severest punishments, even death, interesting to note, awaited false witnesses. Just, just how, <laughs> see just how seriously they took uh, making sure uh, so seriously, they took the responsibility of making sure that only guilty people were sentenced. Again, you might find in one case or another some abuse, but we're talking here, these are the, the rules, the general rules, the principles on which this is operating. Uh, every sentence needed the confirmation of the highest tribunal, which was obliged to examine all the proceedings of the lower tribunals. The prisons were dry, vaulted rooms with plenty of light, and the sick were well cared for. So they didn't throw, people who did have to be arrested weren't just thrown into uh, damp, filthy dungeons. Uh, it says, but there were three points in which the Spanish Inquisition differed from similar courts in other countries. The first was its monarchical constitution, culminating in the Grand Inquisitor. The subsequent centralization of the local tribunals, of which there were 19 in total, in the High Tribunal of Seville and then the, also the permanent legalized influence of the crown, both in the appointment of the officials and of the progress of the trials. Because once again, it was more of a, uh, it, was, it was essentially a, a civil institution. And that it, it is owing to the great power which the state wielded in this institution that executions were far more numerous in Spain than anywhere else. Again and again, popes had to remonstrate against the severity of the Spanish Inquisition. So it was more, whatever severity, excessive severity may have been, it was on the part of the crown, the civil power. And then some other considerations, there, uh, such as the officials of the Inquisition were often tools of the king. So this is the things like this that abuses would have crept in, that you know, might have had a, a king who was, you know, had, had his own interests and wanted you know, to go after somebody, he might use the Inquisition as a tool for doing that. Uh, sometimes they would allow themselves to be overawed by the throne or sought their own ends by slavish subservience to the king, uh, and thus committing gross violations of justice. I mean, I'm sure you could find, uh, I'm, I'm going to read more about this, perhaps bring in the information if I find anything particularly useful or interesting, but I'm sure you could find stories of abuses, but also many stories, probably most of it, 
It was just everything was done according to procedure. Uh, the decrees of Rome protested against excesses, uh, punished officials who abused their power, sometimes, in some cases, annulled sentences that were passed in Spain, sometimes ordered trials to be transferred to Rome, although many times these were ignored by the Spanish court. So many times the, 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 the Pope would say, like, in that case, uh, I want to look at that case uh, more closely, bring, bring this to Rome, but they would refuse. So the crown was, the civil power was more stringent, or was, was harsher than the church. Uh, it happened at times that papal letters addressed to, to the inquisitors were intercepted by Spanish ministers and it never reached their destination. So and that's, that's a type of abuse, without any doubt. Uh, there, was a, there was another clause that, which assigned property of the condemned to the royal treasury. That's going to, you can see how that would cause problems. That was going to cause great, it says that it caused great hardship and led to the condemnation of innocent persons. In the earlier stages of the Inquisition, private charity endeavored to mitigate this hardship. Uh, whereas later on, the king or even the Inquisition itself would, took, would take care of any children whose, whose parents had lost their property as a result of being convicted by the Inquisition. Oh, but it didn't apply to everybody, not to the Moriscos, who were the Muslims. Uh, all says that all contemporary, this, this author Ian Guggenberger says that all contemporary evidence points to about 2,000 executions in total in the whole of Spain between 1481 and 1505. Uh, so you have there about 24 years, 2,000 executions. But then from 1505 to 1820, also only 200,000. Or sorry, 2,000, not 200,000. Like Joe Biden here in Mexico. Saying 200 million instead of 200,000. 2,000, not 200,000. Two, so 2,000 between 1481 and 1505, and that number again, so in 24 years, that number, and then in the following more than 300 years, no more than that number. So you can, you can do the math and compare it to the, how many Catholics were killed by Elizabeth. I think, I think you'd be able to tell which direction the scales would go. Yes? Uh, one more time, what was it between between 1481 and 1505, there were 2,000 executions. And between 1505 and 1820, there were also 2,000 executions. So 4,000 in total in a space of not quite 400 years, but over, well over 300, 340 years approximately. There were a total of 4,000 executions. And he says in the next paragraph, Guggenberger talks about, uh, this is interesting because uh, it seems to go against even what Dara says, that the popular idea of the, what are called the altos da fe, and something else called the San Benitos, he says is radically false, so the popular idea of those things. Um, as you may remember, Dara makes reference to the out, people being burned at the altos da fe. Guggenberger says that it consisted in the solemn liberation of those who have been falsely accused, and in the public reconciliation of penitence with the church, no stake being connected with those ceremonies. So he said that, there, that there's no connection there. Uh, the San Benito, which means a sacus benedictus, so some kind of a, it's a penitential garment, uh, was not more dishonorable than the penance itself. So it wasn't, it was, wasn't something that was horribly humiliating. Uh, obstinate heretics who refused to be reconciled <coughs> were handed over to the secular arm and executed at another time and place. And we've mentioned this before, that and it was the, whenever there was an execution to be done, the civil power did it. Maybe the Inquisition tried the person and said, okay, yes, this person maybe deserves a death sentence, but no one was, ever, no one was put to death by an ecclesiastic. It was, that was done by the civil power. Yes? So, Father, if someone were executed, was that called an auto de fe? Uh, he says no. He said, this author says, no, that executions were something totally separate from the, with the alto da fe, which was um, a, a ceremony, as you said, a profession of faith, right? literally, or acts of faith. Uh, <clears throat> so he says, may, maybe, some, maybe it's used in a popular sense more generally to include, of course, anybody who uh, so he may have been, well, he says that the liberation of those who were accused and the public reconciliation of penitence. So he doesn't even say that 
as they read that in that ceremony that they, they were even handed over to a civil power. And another interesting case here, uh, Saint Peter Arguez was the first inquisitor of Aragon, uh, but that he's represented by the school of history and art that deals chiefly in myths. He says, as an old hoary-headed tyrant, a monster of cruelty and rapacity, whose death sentences depopulated whole districts of Aragon. And that's the mildest charge, popularly, estimates his uh, victims at 2,000. So basically they would ascribe to him half of all the executions ever done by the Inquisition. Yes? Father, is it St. Peter? Arbuez. Oh, yes. Oh, wait, that's not mine. Uh, so, okay, so, but then Google, yes. Sorry, Father, there were two terms, Altos da Fe and what was the other one? San Benitos. Sacus uh -huh. Benedictus. Penitential garment. Uh, he said, so Guggenberg says that the following things are historical facts, that this St. Peter Arbuez was a, a doctor of the University of Huesca and the canon of Saragossa, a man universally esteemed and beloved for his extraordinary humility, piety, eloquence, and charity to the poor, as you would expect from a saint. In 1484, the Inquisition was established in Aragon, and uh, whereupon he was much against his will appointed one of the inquisitors of Zaragoza. Uh, what is certain, he says, Guggenberger says, is that during his administration, one person was sentenced to death and another arrested. That's about as far as you can verify. Uh, what is probable, he concedes, probable, but not supported by any contemporary evidence, not, of it, not from any documents of the time, is that a few suffered the penalties of the law at the hands of the tribunal of which he was an officer. Uh, to intimidate the tribunal, the Maranos of Aragon, in a secret conspiracy, collected 10,000 uh, reals for the murder of Peter Arbues and three other officers of the Inquisition. Uh, and because of which, the saint fell at the altar of his church beneath the daggers of hired assassins in 1485, at the age of 42, after one year's administration. So he must have been effective. <laughs> they killed him after only one year. And they would have us believe that in that one year that he killed 2,000 people. Uh, he was beatified in 1664, after the proof of miracles wrought at his tomb and canonized by Pius IX in 1867. Yes. It was, uh, see the, I forget, I forget which is which, but he said that the Maranos, who were uh, Jews who had feigned conversion, brought about his assassination. And, yes. Sorry, Father, what's the name of the saint again? St. Peter, Peter Arbois. Oh, okay. Can you read this? Yes, sir. Other ways, maybe. Let's look at the accent. Uh, okay, he also says that, very interestingly, that the Spanish Inquisition was not an unpopular Inquisition, uh, presumably with the people who were brought before it, but generally. He says, that on the contrary, uh, it may have met with opposition at times, uh, but he says it was not the people, but the nobility and higher clergy who objected to it on account of its restricting their jurisdiction. So they saw it was the more complaints were brought. He would, from what he's saying, it seems that more complaints were brought against it as interfering with, supposedly interfering with bishops or other or other uh, civil rulers, uh, rather than for being too harsh in its in its measures against uh, the people who were brought before it. So that's an interesting point. Uh, something like probably it was seen a lot like something like a, just a, an ecclesiastical police force. All right, the police force is not. Uh, especially unpopular unless, of course, you're with one of these um, far-left uh, uh, insurrectionist groups. <laughs> but unless you're, unless you're not among them, uh, the police is something that's good to have around. Uh, yes? Uh, this, this, you're speaking right now of the Inquisition of Aragon, but... 
Yeah, so this is, yeah, this is, yes, in uh, in that time frame. So he was, yes, he was assassinated in 1485. So early on, this is early on. Okay, so that, that Inquisition, as opposed to the, the other one was? Well, well yeah, they had, they had, this was, this was, it sounds like this was one of those local, those 19 local tribunals, because okay. they had the Grand, the Grand Tribunal, Torquemada was at the head of that, but then he was able to delegate to other local tribunals. Apparently there were 19 for the whole, the whole nation. 19 local tribunals. At least, uh, yes. And then, so that, the, the, the headquarters, that, where was that? Uh, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't mention that. If they had one place where it stayed. Oh. I could look that up, though. Uh, and he says that, countering some other ac uh, accusations, that nothing is more incorrect than to ascribe the decadence of... Spanish learning and civilization to the Inquisition. Of course, there, in Spain, there would have been some uh, Muslim influence. The Muslims were there for a long time. Uh, Granada, of course, was held by the Moors until 1492. Uh, he's, in fact, he's, he, he asserts that the golden age of Spanish poetry, learning, and culture coincides with the period of its greatest activity. That's what he says. And that both culture and Inquisition went down before the rationalism imported from revolutionary France. Of course, that's few centuries ahead. Uh, he gives the ending date, well, the, uh, the later date for uh, the, the years in which we calculate the executions as ending in 1820. Of course, that's well after the French Revolution. And then he goes on to talk about how uh, it is not just to compare the judicial methods of the Inquisition with those of the present day, and that they must be compared with temporary procedures sanctioned by the public laws. The methods, he says, which we deplore, and he doesn't go into too much detail on what those are. I'm going to, I think I'm going to dig a little bit deeper as to find what he, exactly he's talking about, what cases of abuse that there may have been. He says that the methods which we deplore, so individual cases, uh, were methods of the age, um, things that would have crept in. Uh, the redeeming qualities, on the other hand, were special to, the, to that institution. So in many ways, it was much nicer than a lot of these, a lot of the other tribunals at the time, a lot of other ways of trying people. Uh, at the bar of the Inquisition, the accused had ample time and means to prepare his defense. He was given an attorney who was under oath to faithfully defend his client. And besides that, two priests who had no connection with the Inquisition were bound to protect the accused against arbitrary ruling, to inspect all court records twice, and to report to the authorities. The accused had the right of summoning witnesses in his favor from the remotest region, even from beyond the sea. And in contrast to that, criminal courts in England and elsewhere did not permit that. Uh, of course, right now, at this moment, we're still, we're, not, we're before you know, the Henry VIII, but we'll, we'll get to him soon enough. <coughs> uh, so there, both the charges and the, the charges, charges and the accusers were concealed from the prisoner until his actual appearance in court. So another, as opposed to that in other places. He was not allowed an advocate, nor could he bring forward witnesses in his defense. So essentially saying it's much nicer in many ways than a lot of other inquisition or a lot of other courts <coughs> at the time. And furthermore, the punishment of fire was neither introduced by the church, nor confined to the inquisition, nor the severest method of execution employed by people of past centuries. Which is true, and I mean, think about that. It wasn't the only, obviously, we're talking about it, it could also be applied to people who are guilty of high treason. Uh, it's clearly not the only crime for which someone could be burned at the stake by the, by the civil arm. Uh, so it was, the, it was the punishment for high treason in the case of a woman in England uh, for poisoning and other crimes in France uh, for circulating base coin in the empire. So if you were engaged in counterfeit. Uh, it says the process of being drawn, hanged, disemboweled, and quartered for high treason in England, the boiling to death of prisoners under Henry VIII, the revolting punishment of the wheel on which the criminal was left to linger with broken bones for hours and days in Germany and France were worse than the stake, he says. So clearly, yes, there were, there were punishments that were uh, rather more gruesome than, than even that. But also there, there's a the fact that they were Someone who's being burned to that, someone who's being burned to that might will die of asphyxiation before the fire, before it's starting to be burned. So 
So it would be more of a, a death by suffocation rather than dying by the actual fire. Uh, so, so I just end with this, that finally it is, is worthy of notice that Spain owes to the Inquisition the preservation of the Catholic faith, the acquisition of the national and civil unity, and an unbroken internal peace at the time when, in consequence of the Protestant revolt, nearly all the countries of Europe were suffering and bleeding under the curse of civil and religious wars. So there's a little bit more left, but we'll do it probably Wednesday, yes. And all the, the 4,000 total that were killed, does it mention how many like, had moments of conversion? No, no, it doesn't mention how many were relapses or not. It doesn't mention that. I mean, that'd be something to look into, but it doesn't mention it. All right. <laughs>